I'd like to focus tonight on a fundamental shift that every single leader in this room can act on immediately. One that I've made a central tenet of my leadership. One that is core to this year's forum, thanks to the leadership of our seven exceptional co-chairs. I'm talking about hiring, promoting, and retaining more women. And not just because it's the right thing to do or the nice thing to do, but because it's the smart thing to do. In Canada, like all over the world, much of the economic and labor force growth we've experienced over the last many decades is because of women entering into and changing the workforce. But there is still so much room for improvement and such enormous benefit still to be had. McKinsey estimates that narrowing the gender gap in Canada could add $150 billion to our economy by 2026. Research tells us, tells us that organizations with women on their corporate boards and in key positions of leadership perform better than those without. In fact, the Peterson Institute for International, International Economics just found that increasing the share of women in leadership positions from zero to 30% translated into a 15% boost to profitability. Recent estimates suggest that economic gender parity could add $1.75 trillion to the United States, United States GDP. And in China, the GDP boost could be as much as $2.5 trillion, which is bigger than the entire Canadian economy. Mesdames et Messieurs, embaucher, promouvoir et retenir plus de femmes se traduit non seulement par une augmentation de vos profits, mais aussi par une plus grande diversité d'idées. En effet, l'inclusion des femmes a le pouvoir d'amener l'innovation à un autre niveau et de faciliter la résolution de conflits. Encourager la participation des femmes et vos entreprises, tout comme vos communautés, seront plus fortes. Now, when we talk about getting more women into the workforce, the issue of pay equity comes up, and it should. It's vitally important. In Canada, we'll be moving forward this year with legislation to ensure equal pay for work of equal value at the federal level. And I'm sure there's a few of you in the audience who are thinking, I already have equal pay policies in place. This doesn't apply to me. But while I commend your effort on that front, it may not be good enough. For our own governments, pay equity efforts, while important, are just a first step. Because equal pay for women does not mean equal opportunity, or equal treatment, or equal sacrifice. Paying a female employee the same as a male employee doesn't even begin to touch issues around family planning, promotions, or job security. Women do more part-time work and more unpaid work than men. So how do we address that? See, when we dig a little deeper, when we peel back that outer layer, we see that there are a whole host of barriers facing women in the workplace. Removing those barriers will take effort, leadership, and a willingness to change the nature of work as we know it. Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire? Que pouvons-nous faire? Comment accroître la représentation des femmes au sein des entreprises? Et surtout, comment faire pour les maintenir en poste? Eh bien, nous devons fondamentalement changer la culture d'entreprise de façon à ce que les femmes se sentent accueillies, soutenues et valorisées. So here's where we need to start. It's time to take a serious look at parental leave and childcare policies. We should be encouraging women and men to make the best decision for their family situation. In Canada, we've given parents more options for parental leave and invested billions in affordable, high-quality childcare. 
but there's more to do. We've also introduced a really successful child benefit program that gives middle and low-income parents more money every month, tax-free, to help with the costs of raising kids. And since the Canada Child Benefit gives more money to those who need it most, the financial impact on single mothers has been significant. Last year, nearly 90% of single moms receiving the Canada Child Benefit earned less than $60,000 a year and received about $9,000 in total benefits, tax-free. And let's be clear, helping those families has been a key driver of Canada's recent stellar economic growth. Companies should have a formal policy on gender diversity and make the recruitment of women candidates a priority. You may remember that we introduced our country's first gender-balanced cabinet in 2015. The usual suspects complained, but guess what? Two years later, Christia Freeland and Miriam Monsef, who are here this week, along with their many female colleagues in cabinet, are serving the country with great distinction and have elevated the level of decision-making and debate for everyone in cabinet and in government. As corporate leaders, consider a gender-balanced board or gender-balanced project teams. Anytime we're looking for a new hire, we should be identifying women candidates at a rate equal to men. In Canada, when we look to fill appointments, we work to recruit people who reflect the true diversity of our country. Et nous devons rendre les comptes sur les efforts que nous déployons de façon ouverte et transparente. En fait, nous sommes sur le point d'adopter une loi qui obligerait les entreprises constituées en vertu d'une loi fédérale à divulguer de l'information au sujet de leur politique en matière de diversité. Par exemple, cela inclurait la proportion homme-femme de leur conseil d'administration et de leur haute direction. Quelques autres points à améliorer. Nous devons comprendre que la responsabilité de prendre soin des aînés ou des proches malades revient souvent aux femmes. Alors, la création d'un programme pour les aidants naturels qui contribuerait à réduire les difficultés financières engendrées par une absence au travail est une option qu'on doit envisager. And we have to recognize that aspects of intersectionality are always at play and require special and explicit attention. Here's, a, here's an example. In 2016, among women who were near, newly appointed to the boards of Fortune 500 companies, 77% were white. Race, religion, sexuality, socioeconomic status, those are just a few of the ways that women are even further discriminated against. And finally, here's the really big one. Me Too. Time's up. The Women's March. These movements tell us that we need to have a critical discussion on women's rights, equality, and the power dynamics of gender. Sexual harassment, for example, in business and in government, is a systemic problem, and it is unacceptable. As leaders, we need to recognize and to act to show that truly time is up. We must each have a well-understood, established process in place to file allegations of workplace harassment. And when we receive those complaints, we must take them seriously. As women speak up, it is our responsibility to listen and, more importantly, to believe. Folks, treat these not as piecemeal alternatives to how things are currently run. Treat these examples as fundamental and essential shifts in the way we operate. As governments and as corporations, we are entrusted 
with a platform and a voice. Let's use them. Last year, with our neighbours in the US, we established the Canada-US Council for Advancement of Women Entrepreneurs and Business Leaders. The Council just put out an important report, their first of five, focused on supporting and growing women-owned businesses. We need to listen to them and implement it. Cette année, le Canada préside le G7, dont le sommet aura lieu dans la Charlevoix, au Québec. L'avancement des femmes sur les plans social, politique et économique est un aspect important de notre présidence. L'égalité des sexes et l'analyse comparative entre les sexes seront intégrées dans l'ensemble des thèmes, des activités et des résultats de notre présidence du G7, y compris dans les réunions ministérielles et lors du sommet des dirigeants du G7. Et je suis très heureux d'annoncer que Melinda Gates et Isabelle Hudon seront les coprésidentes du Conseil consultatif pour l'égalité des sexes du G7. Ces deux femmes sont des voix fortes pour l'avancement de l'égalité des sexes et l'autonomisation des femmes et des filles, et s'assureront donc que l'égalité des sexes demeurera une priorité dans tout ce que nous faisons au G7 cette année. I am pleased to announce that the co-chairs for the G7 Gender Equality Advisory Council will be Melinda Gates and Isabelle Hudon. Both of these women are global leaders in the advancement of gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls, and so will ensure that gender equality is a priority throughout everything the G7 does this year. <clears throat> Canada will also, 2018 will also see Canada hosting Fortune's Most Powerful Women International Summit, and 2019 will bring the Women Deliver Conference to Vancouver, the world's largest gathering on health, rights, and well-being of women and girls. So those are just a few examples of what we're doing to draw regular and frequent attention to the untapped potential of women and girls around the world. It's not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing effort to convene, to challenge, and to push boundaries. But that's not to say we've got it all figured out. In Canada, we need more women in politics, more women on corporate boards, and more women in STEM. And that's, of course, just the tip of the iceberg. So, in reflecting on this, let me ask you, what are your challenges? And more importantly, what are you doing to address them? Ladies and gentlemen, the hiring, promotion, and retention of women is something we can make happen today, right now. More women in leadership positions won't just grow our economy, create jobs, and strengthen our communities. It'll also lead to innovation and change in the workplace. Innovation and change that workers desperately need. 